In the past I've had a hard time explaining what virtual reality actually is and how it works without dragging people into an actual virtual reality environment to let them experience it for themselves. So I figured I'd make a slideshow explaining the principles behind immersive 3D graphics, which is the backbone of virtual reality. I'll simplify some things and gloss over some details, but this will be the gist of how it works. To understand virtual reality, we first have to understand 3D vision. Humans have two eyes for a reason, and here's why. To keep things simple, let's use a diagram from a bird's eye view. On the left, we have a viewer, Alice, shown as just her two eyeballs. In the center, we have a real 3D object, here just drawn as an arrow. But this could be any real object, say a Rubik's Cube or a cow. So here's how 3D vision works. Light from the environment bounces off the object, enters Alice's eyes through her pupils, and creates one 2D image on each of her retinas. Because her eyes see slightly different views of the same object, the images on Alice's two retinas will be slightly different as well. The retinal images are transmitted by Alice's optic nerve to her visual cortex, where her brain constructs a mental model of the real object based on those images. In short, Alice perceives the 3D object. Perceiving 3D objects is something that people are really good at. This ability has been with us since our ancestors jumped from tree branch to tree branch and when misperception meant certain doom. Now in virtual reality we fake 3D vision using stereoscopic displays and this is how we do it. We place a screen, or a set of screens, it doesn't really matter, somewhere in front of Alice. These screens are basically large computer monitors. Shown here is a cave-like environment with three walls forming an open box. Then we let our computers project two images of the real object onto each screen. One for Alice's left eye and one for her right eye. In other words, we extend the light rays going from the object into Alice's eyes backwards until they hit the screens. Now the images for either eye will again be slightly, or not so slightly, different. In order to pull this off, we need a screen that can display two different images at the same time, so that Alice's left eye does not see the image projected for her right eye and vice versa. This is where expensive projectors and stereo goggles come into play, but let's not talk about technicalities. Now here's the fundamental trick. We take away the real object. Now, light emitted from the screens instead of the real object enters Alice's eyes through her pupils and hits her retinas, and if everything worked perfectly, which it doesn't quite yet, the images on her retinas will be exactly the same as before. So her optic nerve sent the same information to her visual cortex, and Alice's brain has no choice but to construct the same mental model as before, even though the real object is no longer there. As a result, Alice now cannot help perceiving a virtual 3D object. And that's the important part. This is not a voluntary process and does not take effort. Even for people who cannot see stereo images, or who were never able to see the sailboat in that magic eye picture, it works every time. Now we know how stereoscopic display works, but that's only half the battle. One nasty detail I omitted is that, in order to project images of the real object from Alice's point of view, the computer has to know what Alice's point of view is. In other words, it has to know where Alice's eyes are. Let's go back to the last slide. Here everything is fine. Alice's eyes are in the right place, and the virtual object appears at the exact same place where the real object was. But now Alice moves her head. The images on the screens are still the same, but now Alice sees them from a different view, which means there are now different images on her retinas. As a result, Alice's visual cortex has to change its mental model, and the only model that's consistent with what she sees is the new, different virtual object. If she now moves somewhere else, the same thing happens. This means, whenever Alice moves her head, she perceives a slight change in the virtual object. It may move, it may shrink or grow, or get distorted in weird ways, but real objects don't behave like that, so Alice's visual cortex throws up its hands and gives up, and her perception of the virtual object breaks down. Oh, and she might get dizzy, too. The bottom line is that stereoscopic display by itself is not sufficient to create virtual reality, i.e., the illusion of virtual objects appearing real. To fix this problem, we need to tell the computer exactly where Alice's head is at all times. This is called head tracking, and getting it right is another huge technical problem that I'll skip over. But if you do get it right, this is what happens. Alice moves her head again, but now the computer is aware of that and knows exactly where her eyes are. Using that information, it can project images of the real object from Alice's new point of view. The images on the screens will be different from before, but Alice doesn't notice that, because she is not actually perceiving the images on the screens, but the virtual object that they form. Her visual cortex constructs a mental model based on the new images, and lo and behold, it will be the exact same mental model as before. While the images on the screen have moved, the virtual object has stayed in the same place. It doesn't even matter that the screen images span a corner between two screens and have a kink in them. Alice sees the virtual object as perfectly straight. And of course, it works the same way from any other point of view as well. No matter how Alice moves, the virtual object she perceives stays perfectly still. She can walk up to it to get a closer look at a detail, she can reach out and touch it. In short, she can pretend that it's a real object and interact with it that way. 
And that's how virtual reality works. The benefit is that it can be used to present computer-generated objects and users can perceive them and interact with them as if they were real. They can take virtual field trips, grab virtual atoms to create virtual molecules or crystal structures, measure 3D medical images and plan surgeries, or literally immerse themselves in games. But those are topics for other videos. There is one technical detail that I do want to address, where to place the screens needed to create immersion and how big to make them. So far we've been looking at a cave-like virtual reality environment where the screens are large, about 10 by 8 feet or more, and form an open box users can step into. However, it doesn't matter at all where one places the screens. After all, virtual reality doesn't really use the screens to show images, the screens are merely scaffolding to prop up the shown virtual objects. For example, one could outfit Alice with a head-mounted display which contains one small screen directly in front of each of her eyes. Then the computer would again project images of a real object, but now the left and right eye images are shown on separate screens. Light from the small screens enters Alice's eyes and hits her retinas, and her visual cortex again perceives a virtual object that corresponds exactly to the no longer there real object. Head-mounted displays require head-tracking just as cave-like environments, and both types of system have their own benefits and drawbacks. HMDs are generally slightly less expensive than caves, require less space, and offer a more complete immersion. On the downside, HMDs are much more prone to eye fatigue and so-called simulator sickness, which is a feeling of nausea caused by the delay between the motion of the user's head and the following update of the screen images. Caves were specifically invented to reduce simulator sickness and can in practice be used for many hours without ill effects. To wrap up, I'd like to say a few words about the other videos on this channel. There's a fundamental problem with filming a virtual reality environment, since the computer can only generate screen images from one point of view. So if Alice is using the cave and Bob is filming her, either Alice's head is tracked, which means she gets immersion but nothing meaningful shows up on tape, or Bob's video camera is tracked, in which case the video looks great but Alice doesn't see what she's doing. We shot all of our videos with the tracked video camera to show as much as possible what it's like to use virtual reality. This means that the users shown in those videos don't get immersion, which is why the interactions seem somewhat awkward. In reality, interactions in the cave are intuitive and fluid, but there's no way to film that. Keep this in mind when viewing the other videos. Don't complain that this guy keeps missing measurements or that guy keeps running into walls. It's not a flaw of the system, it's just a flaw of how we filmed it.